Good afternoon and welcome to the Shaith Lecture in Indian Studies. Celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, the annual Shaith Lecture in Indian Studies is made possible by the generous support of the Shaith Family Foundation, which is dedicated to raising awareness of the culture and history of India and South Asia and to serving the Indian community in Atlanta and the Southeast. We at the Carlos Museum are deeply grateful to Dr. Jadik Sheth and Madhu Sheth for their generous support and partnership. On behalf of the Sheth Family Foundation, I want to thank Carlos Museum and the Gozieta Global Program for hosting this event. I also want to thank Elizabeth Horner specifically to be the moderator and Mega Madan who has done all the enormous work behind the scenes as two great volunteers doing this particular presentation. And Amitabh, welcome again. I know you came last time here right after the 9-11 disaster and you spoke with such a great, great emotion way or some people cried in the audience is my memory. You moved the people as much in your speech as you do in your writings. Again, coming back again this time with a new message. Again, our welcome to you. Back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shaith. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back. Thank you for inviting me again. And I'm really glad to be, uh, glad to be here, well, virtually there uh, with you again. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we are honored to welcome Amitav Ghosh back to Emory for his second Shaith lecture, though this time virtually. Amitav Ghosh was born in Calcutta and raised and educated in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Iran, Egypt, India, and the United Kingdom, where he received his PhD in social anthropology from the University of Oxford. Although perhaps best known for his acclaimed works of fiction, such as The Glass Palace, the Hungry Tide, and the Ibis Trilogy, among others. He has also written piercing essays chronicling cat cat catastrophe and upheaval in the contemporary world, contextualized by incisive and painstakingly researched examinations of the historical events that contributed to them. In 2019, Foreign Policy named Amitav Ghosh one of the most important global thinkers of the decade for his searing indictment of the inadequate response to the climate crisis in the great derangement, climate change and the unthinkable. The book was also awarded the inaugural Utah Award for the Environmental Humanities in 2018. We are honored to welcome Dr. Ghosh back today to speak about our current period, which he believes historians will look back on as the great derangement. Dr. Ghosh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you for those uh, for those very kind words. So today I'm going to be talk, uh, speaking about uh, the Great Derangement, and I'm, it's uh, it's going to be a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Plus, uh, I'll be reading uh, from the first parts of the book. Uh, but I'm going to start with a film that my uh, Indian um, uh, publishers made. Uh, it's it's just it's just a short film. It begins very softly, so don't worry uh, about the sound. But uh, but you may have to turn up the volume on your computers to to listen properly. So here it is. Here we go. Climate events are very, very difficult to write about. Extreme events, improbable events are very difficult to write about. And I know this myself as a writer. I had an extraordinary encounter with a very, very uh, strange weather event. I didn't even recognize what it was because, you know, we didn't, uh, we in India have very little awareness of uh, phenomena like tornadoes. For years afterwards, I tried to write about this event in, uh, in a sort of meaningful way. I tried to sort of even think of incorporating it in my in my books and novels and I always found myself struggling with it. I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working in the system quite some years now. And what I can tell you is uh, the oceans are being hit in various ways that you cannot even imagine. Just look at the cost of our deep 
food production. You know, what does it mean to produce those fish on your table? You know, now the major gear that we used to catch and produce a lot of our seafood is uh, trawl fishers. Now, this is a technique that is really unselective. It's destructive. Uh, you target a few species, but you pretty much catch an entire ecosystem in your net. Now, this not just obviously has an impact on the ecosystem, but it also has a huge impact on livelihoods of small scale fishing communities that depend on a lot of these fish species and also a long term sort of survival of the fishery itself. You have all these multiple stressors acting on a marine system. Okay, that have an impact, as I said, not just on ecosystems, but also on livelihoods. And you sort of uh, have the overarching umbrella of climate change. Now, that is like the recipe for a perfect storm. Just this year, this incredible heat wave that we've had across northern India and across central India, I mean, it's astonishing, unprecedented. It's been a problem for the monsoon. So even now, climate models don't all agree on whether the monsoon rainfall will increase or decrease. But what all models agree about is that the frequency of extremes is going to change, which means the frequency of droughts and uh, excess rainfall years, that is going to be changed. Uh, for example, in 2015, you know that uh, we are sitting in Maharashtra. In Marathwada region of Maharashtra, more than 1,000 farmers committed suicide. And you and I were paying more than rupees 200 per kilo of tur dal. Now, these are all adverse impacts of the drought. So the question arises, are we adapting to this? And after all, unlike unexpected effects of climate change, droughts are nothing new. We've experienced droughts for centuries. So we should have been able to adapt. Are we adapting to it? Unfortunately, it appears that we are not adapting to it and still there are very large impacts on agriculture economy and so on if you consider that you know parliament just a couple of weeks ago finally held uh, some uh, a session uh, to talk about the drought and only 80 MPs to discuss what is the most single most important uh, thing that is happening uh, in this country right now i mean it really does in a way defy belief the inconvenient truth in climate change is not that climate change is happening but that climate change is about sharing the economic growth between nations and within nations. I mean, if you look at the most recent uh, sorts of uh, uh, weather-related events around India, you know, so for example, these terrible deluges that have happened in Mumbai in these last uh, eight to ten years, this terrible deluge that we saw in Chennai, uh, you know, last year. I mean, uh, you know, those things are are on our doorstep. What does it mean for our cities? It means that we need to design our systems so well that you have much better systems of sanitation. You have no water retention that happens in your cities. You're able to design your green areas in ways in which your green spaces can absorb the extreme heat that happens. You need to design your city so that you can hold the water when it falls. Over the last uh, 150 years or so, the, the, the direction that literature and literary fiction has taken has carried it away from all sorts of natural engagements. It's carried it more and more towards abstractions of various kinds. It's become, uh, uh, literature has become more and more sort of focused on, uh, on urban areas, on, uh, on the urban experience, on urbanity as such. That to me raises many, many interesting questions. How is it that literature, which in many ways has always historically dealt with the most important issues in the human condition, you know, uh, uh, why is it that literature has turned away from this? In that sense, you could say that, uh, you know, the whole, the whole trajectory of fiction uh, is also implicated in uh, the same kind of derangement that carries people closer and closer to the sea, where they're so uh, exposed to all these uh, natural impacts. Today, we are voiceless, we are powerless. We are not asking our leaders to step up their game because it concerns us, our present, and our children's future. It concerns the survival of humankind.
Well, you'll, you'll all be very glad to know uh, that uh, Sunita Narayan, who was the last person speaking there, has just today been given a very big award, uh, very richly deserved. She's an absolute pioneer. Uh, she co-authored uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, a major paper on climate justice, which is one of the foundational uh, texts, really, of the climate justice movement. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's great to see that her work is being recognized. Of course, it has always been recognized, but is even more recognized now. So I'm going to start uh, by uh, reading to you a little bit from the beginning of uh, The Great Derangement. Who can forget those moments when something that seems inanimate turns out to be vitally, even dangerously alive? As for example, when an arabesque in the pattern of a carpet is revealed to be a dog's tail, which, if stepped upon, could lead to a nipped ankle. Or <clears throat> when we reach for an innocent looking vine and find it to be a worm or a snake, when a harmlessly drifting log turns out to be a crocodile. It was a shock of this kind, I imagine, that the makers of the Empire Strikes Back had in mind when they conceived of the scene in which Han Solo lands the Millennium Falcon on what he takes to be an asteroid, but only to discover that he has entered the gullet of a sleeping space monster. To recall that memorable scene now, more than 35 years after the making of the film, is to recognize its impossibility. For if ever there were a Han Solo in the near or distant future, his assumptions about interplanetary objects are certain to be very different from those that prevailed in California at the time when the film was made. The humans of the future will surely understand knowing what they presumably will know about the, about the history of their forebears on Earth, that only in one very brief era, lasting less than three centuries, did a significant number of their kind believe that planets and asteroids are inert. My ancestors were ecological refugees long before the term was invented. They were from what is now Bangladesh, and their village was on the shore of the Padma River, which is one of the mightiest waterways in the land. The story, as my father told it, was this. One day in the mid 1850s, the great river suddenly changed course, drowning the village. Only a few of the inhabitants had managed to escape to higher ground. It was this catastrophe that had unmoored our, our forebears. In its wake, they began to move westward and did not stop until the year 1856 when they settled once again on the banks of a river, the Ganges in Bihar. I first heard this story on a nostalgic family trip as we were journeying down the Padma River in a steamboat. I was a child then, and as I looked into those swirling waters, I imagined a great storm with coconut palms bending over backward until their fronds lashed the ground. I envisioned women and children racing through howling winds as the waters rose behind them. I thought of my ancestors sitting huddled on an outcrop, looking on as their dwellings were washed away. To this day, when I think of the circumstances that have shaped my life, I remember the elemental force that untethered my ancestors from their homeland and launched them on the series of journeys that preceded and made possible my own travels. When I look into, into my past, the river seems to meet my eyes, staring back as if to ask, do you recognize me wherever you are? Recognition is famously a passage from ignorance to knowledge. To recognize then is not the same as an initial introduction, nor does recognition require an exchange of words. More often than not, we recognize mutely. And to recognize is by no means to understand that which meets the eye. Comprehension need play no part in a moment of recognition. The most important element of the word recognition thus lies in its first syllable, which harks back to something prior, an already existing awareness that makes possible the passage from ignorance to knowledge. A moment of recognition occurs when a prior awareness flashes before us, effecting an instant change in our understanding of that which is beheld. Yet this flash cannot appear spontaneously it cannot disclose itself except in the presence of its lost other. The knowledge that results from recognition then is not of the same kind as the discovery of something new. 
It arises from a renewed reckoning with the potentiality that lies within oneself. This, I imagine, was what my forebears experienced on that day when the river rose up to claim their village. They awoke to the reckoning they awoke to the recognition of a presence that had molded their lives to the point where they had come to take it as much for granted as the air they breathed. But of course, the air too can, be, can come to life with sudden and deadly violence, as it did in Cameroon in 1988, when a great cloud of carbon dioxide burst forth from Lake Nyos and rolled into the surrounding villages, killing 1,700 people and an untold number of animals. But more often, it does so with, with a quiet insistent, insistence, as the inhabitants of New Delhi and Beijing know all too well, when inflamed lungs and sinuses prove once again that there is no difference between the without and the within, between using and being used. These two are moments of recognition in which it dawns on us that the energy that surrounds us flowing under our feet and through wires in our walls, animating our vehicles and illuminating our rooms is an all-encompassing presence that may have its own purposes about which we know nothing. It was in this way too that I became aware of the urgent proximity of non-human presences through instances of recognition that were forced upon me by my surroundings. I happened then to be writing about the Shundurbun the great mangrove forest of the Bengal Delta, where the flow of water and silt is such that geological processes that usually unfold in deep time appear to occur at a speed where they can be followed from week to week and month to month. The Shundarbhan is a really astonishing and uh, magnificent landscape. Uh, it's very difficult to get a sense of what a mangrove forest actually is like, but uh, uh, I was just recently looking through my, my materials on the Shundurbun, and I found many video clips. So I'm going to play one of these video clips uh, uh, in the background uh, as I read, so it will give you some sense of what the Shundurbun is like. Uh, there's no sound, so don't, uh, don't worry about that if you don't see it. Overnight, a stretch of riverbank will disappear, sometimes taking houses and people with it. But elsewhere, a shallow mud bank will arise and within weeks, the shore will have broadened by several feet. For the most part, these processes are of course cyclical. But even back then, in the first years of the 21st century, portents of, of accumulative and irreversible change could also be seen in receding shorelines and a steady intrusion of salt water on lands that had previously been cultivated. This is a landscape so dynamic that its very changeability leads to innumerable moments of recognition. I captured some of these in my notes from that time, as for example, in these lines written in May, 2002. I do believe it to be true that the land here is demonstrably alive, that it does not exist solely or even incidentally as a stage for the enactment of human history, that it is itself a protagonist. Elsewhere in another note, I wrote, here, even a child will begin a story about his grandmother with the words, in those days, the river wasn't here and the village was not where it is. Yet I would not be able to speak of these encounters as instances of recognition if some prior awareness of what I was witnessing had not already been implanted in me, perhaps by childhood experiences like that of going to look for my family's ancestral village or by memories like that of a cyclone in Dhaka when a small fish pond behind our walls suddenly turned into a lake and came rushing into our house, or by my grandmother's stories of growing up beside a mighty river, or simply by the insistence with which the landscape of Bengal forces itself on the artists, writers, and filmmakers of the region. But when it came to translating these perceptions into the medium of my imaginative life, into fiction that is, I found myself confronting challenges of a wholly different order. Back then, those challenges seemed to be particular to the book I was then writing, The Hungry Tide. But now, many years later, at a moment when the accelerating impacts of global warming have begun to threaten the very existence of low-lying areas like the Shundurbun, it seems to me that those problems have far wider implications. I've come to recognize that the challenges that climate change poses for the contemporary, contemporary writer 
although specific in some respects, are also products of something broader and older, that they derive ultimately from the grid of literary forms and conventions that came to shape the narrative imagination in precisely that period when the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere was rewriting the destiny of the earth. So now I'm going to read to you a little bit from <clears throat> another part of the book. And uh, it's about uh, science fiction and the beginnings of science fiction. The separation of science fiction from the literary mainstream came about not as the result of a sudden drawing of boundaries, but rather through a slow and gradual process. There was, however, one moment that was critical to this process, and uh, it happens to have had a link to a climate-related event. The seismic event that began on April 5th, 1815, on Mount Tambora, 300 kilometers to the east of Bali, was the greatest volcanic eruption in recorded history. Over the next few weeks, the volcano would send 100 cubic kilometers of debris shooting into the air. The plume of dust, 1.7 million tons of it, soon spread around the globe, obscuring the sun and causing temperatures to plunge by three to six degrees. There followed several years of severe climate disruption. Crops failed around the world and there were famines in Europe and China. The change in temperature may also have triggered a, a cholera epidemic in India. In many parts of the world, 1816 would come to be known as the year without a summer. In May that year, Lord Byron, besieged by scandal, left England and moved to Geneva. He was accompanied by his physician, John Polidori. As it happened, Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, who had recently eloped together, were also in Geneva at the time, staying at the same hotel. Accompanying them was Mary Godwin's stepsister, Claire, with whom Byron had had a brief affair in England. Shelley and Byron met on the afternoon of May 27th, and shortly afterward, they moved with their respective parties to two, to two villas on the shores of Lake Geneva. From there, they were able to watch thunderstorms approaching over the mountains. An almost perpetual rain confines us principally to the house, Mary Shelley wrote. One night we enjoyed a finer storm than I had ever be beheld before. The lake was lit up, the pines and the Jura made visible, and all the scene illuminated for an instant when a pitchy blackness succeeded and the thunder came in frightful bursts over our heads amid the darkness. One day, trapped indoors by incessant rain, Byron suggested that they all write ghost stories. A few days later, he outlined an idea for a story on the subject of the vampiric aristocrat, August Darvel. After eight pages, Byron abandoned the story and his idea was taken up instead by Polidori. It was eventually published as The Vampire and is now regarded as the first in an ever fecund stream of fantasy writing. Mary Shelley, too, had decided to write a story, and one evening, a stormy one, no doubt, the conversation turned to the question of whether a corpse could, uh, would be reanimated. Galvanism had, give token of such things, had, had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endowed with a vital warmth. The next day, she began writing Frankenstein or the, or the modern Prometheus. Published in 1818, the novel created a sensation. It was reviewed in the best known journals by some of the most prominent writers of the time. And of course, the story of uh, uh, Frankenstein is very much with, uh, with us to this day. And as you can see, it's constantly being remade, but uh, we sometimes tend to forget that uh, 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 all of this began with a, uh, with a seismic event, really, that is the explosion of Mount Tambora, uh, this, this great eruption. And that had this direct influence on the literary world. So I'm going to stop there. And now we'll have uh, questions and answers. There we are. Thank you. 
Dr. Ghosh, as I wait for people to put their questions into um, the q and A, I I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about, you know, why you chose that passage and, and find a way to connect for us um, what, you, what you wrote in the book about science fiction versus literary fiction and sort of the inability for contemporary literary fiction to, um, to successfully address climate change um, and, and the, 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 um, the um, uh, improbable and the uncanny, as you say. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, for a long time, when you wrote about stuff like, uh, you know, disasters or, uh, you know, terrible kinds of climate events and so on, you were almost always removed to some kind of genre. You know, genres like uh, disaster fiction or apocalyptic fiction. So there were all these various genres or fantasy and so on. Serious fiction uh, was meant to be about what, uh, you know, uh, people's uh, inner lives. It was meant to be about people's um, uh, relationships and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I've, I was very struck by the strange division between these two because often, in fact, it seems to me that the most serious writing that we've seen came from people who were not writing serious fiction in that sense, uh, but were writing very seriously about other sorts of things. The perfect example is Ursula Le Guin, uh, you know, Ursula Le Guin, the great science fiction writer uh, who really left us such a rich legacy. And yet, uh, you know, this, the curious thing was that she all her life remained, uh, you know, in the literary imagination, a science fiction a, a, a writer, you know, rather than a writer of serious fiction. And I think this rankled with her. And suddenly it's rankled with many other writers who've, uh, you know, written very, very seriously uh, about, the, about the state of the world that we are actually in. So, you know, my book, my thinking about, uh, you know, literature and climate change really began to uh, center upon this notion of seriousness. What is seriousness? I mean, if within uh, uh, the sort of institutions of literary life, uh, you don't begin to see how very serious these terrible storms and these terrible uh, disasters, these droughts, these fires, if you don't see how serious they are, what does it actually say about what you think of as literature, you know? Uh, historically, literature has always dealt with all these issues. Uh, you know, these are the most pressing, pressing issues that human beings have ever faced. So what is it that leads uh, a contemporary humanity to imagine uh, that it's somehow free from all the, all that is around us? So in, in the book, you talk a lot about what happened to the novel in the modern period, the 19th and 20th century, and how it becomes focused on sort of a, a moral adventure of an individual character, as opposed to the collective. And, and you also speak about, um, or write about the, the idea of being able to think of the landscape or the environment or the earth as a, as a protagonist instead of a setting. Um, can you say more about that and how that's connected to this part about science fiction versus literary fiction? Certainly. Uh, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, look, uh, I would have to say, first of all, that we should note that this development uh, in literature is of a very recent date, really. I mean, it starts, I would say, in the post-war period. But uh, remember, uh, you know, uh, John Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath, uh, you know, to me, in many ways, The Grapes of Wrath is, is a climate change novel, you know, especially if you look at the, uh, the opening chapter of Grapes of Wrath, it's, a, uh, it's really about a deranged climate, you know, a disordered climate, what sets his characters in motion. And, uh, you know, uh, and it's very much a novel about a group, it's a, it's a novel about a collectivity. In many ways, I think Steinbeck really showed us how we can write about these uh, uh, these issues and these events. But remember, uh, Steinbeck, even in his own lifetime, was often vilified by his contemporaries uh, in the literary in the literary world, especially by East Coast writers. You know, 
uh, there was a lot of hostility towards him within, uh, within the American literary establishment. And what it ultimately boiled down to, I think, is that he was writing about poor people, you know, uh, he was not writing about the, uh, you know, about the fashionable great Gatsby's of the world, or about, uh, you know, uh, hunters that are traveling to Africa, that kind of thing, uh, like Hemingway and uh, Scott Fitzgerald were, and they felt uh, a great deal of hostility towards them simply because of that. But there again, I think, uh, you know, Steinbeck was really a kind of pioneer. And I should also add that, uh, you know, since I wrote The Great Derangement, I think there's been a, a major shift within the literary world, you know? And that shift, I think, was uh, really became visible in about 2018. Uh, in the year 2018, there were so many massive disasters, you know, climate disasters of so many kinds that people finally began to realize that, uh, you know, this is happening, it's on our doorsteps, it's not in the future, it's happening right now, you know. And uh, I, I think that really inaugurated a major change in the, uh, and uh, 2018 also happened coincidentally to be the year that uh, Richard Powers's Over Story was published. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a major development uh, that uh, Over Story was not treated, uh, you know, as a, a genre novel. You know, it was not treated as science fiction or as, you know, fantasy or whatever. Uh, and I think that was a very major development. And I think I, I see now that more and more books of this kind are being written. So you, you spoke about the landscape being a protagonist. I would say it's not just the landscape. I think we have to look at non-human protagonists of many different kinds, you know. And that's exactly what uh, what uh, um, Overstory does. Uh, it gives it gives a voice uh, to trees, you know. And it's remarkable that uh, you know that uh, despite that, uh, Powers's book was uh, really taken uh, 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 very seriously, even within uh, uh, the literary establishment. Now you have to remember that you know in other ways of storytelling. It's never been the case that non-humans don't have voices. Right. I notice uh, right now you have a, you know, you have a show on the Ramayana and the Mahabharat uh, up uh, up in your museum, and the Ramayana and Mahabharat are filled uh, uh, with non-human voices. You know, absolutely teem with non-human voices of many kinds. And this is not just specific to the Ramayana and Mahabharat. Uh, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey also have so many kinds of non-human voices. So I think you know. One of the aspects of this derangement really is that literature as it developed through the 19th and 20th centuries uh, really took away the non-human voice, you know, and we have to find ways of restoring uh, a voice to the non-human. And in your book, you really connected that to um, mathematics and economics and numbers people. Um, can you share a little bit about how you see that one affecting the other? Well, we do live in an age of uh, enumeration, you know, we live in an age of numbers and certainly it's uh, in my book, uh, the argument I make uh, is that uh, in the 19th century, people began to think probabilistically, you know, they began to think in terms of probability and uh, the ideas of, uh, of the idea of probability really seeped into every aspect of our lives, you know, actuarial tables and so on. And certainly, uh, you know, prob probability is also the language of climate science largely, you know. Uh, it's how people talk about, uh, you know, the probability of the sea rising X number of meters uh, by such and such date and so on and so forth. But, you know, one of the things also that we see today is that the language of probability itself is dissolving in the face of climate change because climate change is nonlinear, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, things happen that are completely unpredictable. I mean, one of the commonest phrases that we see today is <laughs> the climate scientists are astounded, climate scientists are surprised, climate scientists uh, can't figure out, uh, you know, are the, I mean, they're just astonished by how fast uh, things are happening. 
And it's interesting in that regard how uh, climate scientists even have started adopting a kind of vitalist language. You know, uh, one uh, one great uh, Willie Brooker, you know, one, one of the great climate scientists, uh, speaks of uh, the climate as an angry beast. Mm -hmm. And actually, what's really interesting uh, is that uh, Lovelock, uh, you know, uh, who came up uh, with the Gaia hypothesis and so on, uh, in uh, consultation with Lynn, Mar uh, collaboration, I should say, with Lynn Margulis. Uh, but, uh, you know, Lovelock uses a completely vitalist language. You know, he, he calls uh, for science to start uh, looking for soul, uh, you know, uh, in the world, in, in non-human entities. So that's been a very major change, I would say, in, uh, in the ways in which we think about things. Can you um, take us from, your, from the great arrangement to your most recent novel, Gun Island, and how you, um, approached all of these concerns in that, that novel, um, which was a, not only about climate change itself, but the, the migration that it is causing. Um, and it was a, a beautiful novel that goes from Bengal to North Africa to Venice. And um, I remember myself reading it one night, um, I think in March, and you know, then to go turning off the light, going to sleep, and had read a part about the the main character, the rare book dealer who was attending a conference at the Getty, and how the fires at the Getty um, were causing it to be evacuated. And I get up the next morning and turn on the news, and yes, they're concerned that the fires in California are going to force the Getty to be evacuated. So it is so much of the moment, um, but also really gives a, a human a way to look at how the climate crisis is affecting individuals. I'm wondering if you could just say more about that beautiful book. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's wonderful to have your response to the book. Uh, you know, that, that scene that you mentioned of, uh, you know, these wildfires uh, creeping up on the Getty, uh, that happened, as you say. And, uh, but, you know, I wrote that scene about a year before it actually happened. You know, it was, it was really kind of uh, so uncanny, you know, it was deeply unsettling. And that's what I mean, you know, in many ways, uh, the period that we are in, the time that we are in now uh, is, is profoundly uncanny. I mean, things happen that we can't uh, imagine really, I mean, unfolding around us. Well, you know, when I was writing The Great Derangement, I kept thinking to myself, oh my God, this is going to make it so hard for me to write another novel because I, I have all these ideas that I have to sort of invest uh, in any fiction that I write in the future. But, uh, you know, at the end of writing uh, Gun Island, I felt that I had actually <clears throat> done what I would want um, me to do as a writer, you know. Uh, I had written, uh, I mean, Gun Island is not a book about one particular setting. And I think that's really one of the great challenges, uh, uh, you know, of this time. Uh, because, you know, novelists historically have always written about settings. You know, settings are very kind of important um, to the novel as a form. But today, what we see unfolding around us uh, really can't, is not a local phenomenon. You know, it cannot be localized in any one place. It's unfolding globally. So we have to start thinking about, you know, those global sorts of uh, uh, displacements, those go uh, these, these global impacts. And suddenly, you know, Gun Island began uh, with my noticing uh, a very long time ago uh, that so many of the of the workers in Venice uh, were B uh, Bengalis. You know, it was something that was quite astonishing to me. Uh, I, I would I'd be wandering around Venice and I would hear Bengali all around me. And now one notices that increasingly in so many places, on the west coast of India, in Goa, uh, you know, uh, where I spend a lot of time. Uh, you know, Goa is a long way from Bengal, but now the working class in Goa is almost, uh, is largely from the east and largely from uh, Bengal. People are being, uh, the, the, you know, I, I showed you the Shundurbon, which is like a half drowned land. And millions of people are being driven out of the Shundarbun uh, because of cyclones, because of saltwater intrusion. Just recently, during this pandemic, uh, there was a there was a terrible cyclone uh, 
uh, in the Shundurban cyclone Amphan. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of people were displaced. So we are seeing these things really at first hand all around us now. There's a wonderful part in the great derangement um, towards the end of the book where you compare two documents. One is the, um, the document created by the signers of the Paris Climate Accord and the other is a document written by Pope Francis. Um, and, and I'm wondering if you could talk about those two documents and how you see one representing a particular um, sort of mechanistic view of dealing with the crisis and the other is a call to collectivism and, and talk about them a, a little bit. That was such a powerful part of the book, um, pitting the Pope against the Paris Climate Accord, especially as we perhaps are able to re-enter it. Thank you. Look, you know, for better or for worse, climate change as a phenomenon uh, has come to be identified with a certain kind of uh, university produced knowledge, you know, uh, it's come to be identified with te technology, with science, with economics. And, uh, you know, almost everything we know about climate change, the phenomenon, uh, comes out of Western uh, academic institutions and uh, Western think tanks and so on, you know. And these institutions speak a certain kind of language, you know, it's an expert language, it's a credential discourse. And climate change has come to be completely wrapped up within this uh, within this credential discourse, you know. But you know, I think it's sort of important to remember uh, that actually climate change is much much vaster than this uh, credential discourse. I mean, where are the voices of uh, you know the migrants who are being displaced? Where are the voices of uh, you know women who have to uh, walk uh, you know long distances because their wells are drying up because of drought? You know, this is happening across India and in large parts of Africa. Why do these voices not figure so much uh, in the discourse, you know? And I think that is one of the things that is so remarkable about uh, uh, Laudato Si, uh, Pope Francis's uh, encyclical on climate change, that, you know, he's, he doesn't participate in the credential discourse as such. You know, his uh, Laudato Si is profoundly informed by science, you know, by uh, by expert knowledge, if you like, uh, he actually formed a, a, a committee to advise him, and so on. But what is so striking about Laudato Si is that it's a document that's trying to reach ordinary people. You know, it's a document written in the just rhetorically speaking. It's written in such simple, powerful language. You know, and ultimately, you know, the Pope is calling also for climate justice. That is absolutely fundamentally what he's calling for. He's calling for climate justice. He's calling for a change in our ways of thinking, change in our ways of living, you know? And as far as I'm concerned, you know, there can be no so-called solution to the climate crisis without thinking of these, uh, thinking of these issues. So in so many ways, I do think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pope Francis, uh, is really uh, the most significant world leader uh, on these issues, you know. By contrast, if you take, uh, you know, the, uh, the Paris Climate uh, uh, Accords or whatever, the first place the United States walked out of it. You know, maybe they'll rejoin, but in any case, uh, the accords in, uh, were watered down because of pressure from the United States. So, you know, it was a great achievement in so many ways that we actually came out with this, uh, with some sort of uh, agreement between uh, so many countries. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you actually read uh, the the document that came out of it, it seems uh, you, you recognize at once that it's not meant to reach a public. You know, it's written in a, in a kind of uh, language which you can only call a kind of internationalist jargon, <laughs> you know. The whole idea is, is that, uh, you know, to confine uh, the discourse within a certain, uh, within a certain expert sphere. Uh, Pope Francis's uh, Laudato Si is exactly the opposite. It's trying to reach outside that expert sphere. 
So that's one of the themes that, of course, um, the arts can do. And certainly Richard Powers, the overstory, um, did that and Gun Island. And also you mentioned Barbara Kingsolver's earlier flight behavior. Um, could you talk a little bit about the responsibility that you feel fiction writers have to address these issues? And who is who sends power? Um, have you have you seen that is is doing this? Who are what are the most recent books we should all be reading? Oh my goodness! If you don't, if you uh, told me you wanted a list of um, recommendations, I'd, uh, I'd, have, I'd I'd have prepared one, but I haven't. You know, I think one book that is really worth reading. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, Annie Prue's uh, Bark Skins. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a book that really, I think, uh, should be should be taken very seriously within this uh, uh, within uh, this entire field because you know she places climate change uh, really within the context of history. You know, especially settler colonial history, which is uh, I think fundamentally, uh, absolutely fundamental to this entire process. Uh, you know. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm seeing here that uh, on 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 the uh, on the questions uh, uh, page that uh, I have in front of me that a lot of uh, people are asking about uh, the intersections of imperialism, colonialism, yeah. and climate change. Well, what can I tell you? I've just finished writing uh, the the sort of successor volume to the Great Derangement, and it's all about these it's all about these issues. Fundamentally. I, I think the, you know, the mistake that uh, people make in the framing of climate change is, is to frame it as a matter of economics and a, uh, as a matter of technology. Fundamentally, climate change is uh, rooted in history. It's rooted in histories of colonialism, imperialism, and so on. I mean, you can see that so clearly. I mean, uh, you know, if you go to India or China or Indonesia or wherever and ask uh, an ordinary person, are you willing to make uh, uh, cuts in your in your emissions? What are they going to say? They're going to say, "Why should we make cuts?" You know. Uh, so that brings up a question that someone has put in into the chat. Um, somebody says, "Was fascinated about your writing and the loss of collectivism, which we which also seems to be a part of the problem in dealing with the COVID pandemic." And so, can you talk a little bit about the the failure of collectivism? I don't know that I would call it collectivism. It doesn't have to be something, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to come, uh, you know, with that heavy baggage, you know, uh, because collectivism, we identify with the Soviet Union and so on, where it had disastrous results. I, what I'm trying to talk about really is the ability to, uh, of people to make decisions in relation to others, you know, and I think the COVID pandemic is a very good indicator, a predictor, you might say, of the ways in which climate change is going to play out. Of course, uh, you know, uh, climate change and the pandemic are not causally related. It's not as if climate change caused the pandemic or whatever, but they are cognate. They are cognate phenomena in the sense that both are caused by the increasing acceleration that we see in world systems. You know, in forms of uh, production, consumption, in forms of communication, and so on. I mean, all of these are, are interconnected. So I do feel that you know, we should treat this pandemic as a very good indicator of what lies ahead. And in that sense, I think it really represents this pandemic. Really represents what you might call a sort of world historical rupture. You know, in the trajectory of uh, the last two hundred years. Because uh, which of the countries that have responded best? Uh, you know, it's uh, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, China, Vietnam. You know, Vietnam. We don't talk about enough, but Vietnam has had some of the some of the best results. Equally, countries within Africa, Sierra Leone is one of the countries. I think it's second uh, at the, on the global rankings of who treated the uh, foreign policy magazine actually published a kind of uh, a, a list of which countries have responded best and Sierra Leone is one of the top and many African countries have dealt with this very well you know when the uh, when this whole uh, 
uh, pandemic started, there were many American so-called thought leaders who were out there saying, oh, Africa, this is going to be the African apocalypse and so on. And it turned out to be very far from, um, uh, from that. You know, Somalia at one point was sending doctors to Italy. You know, I think we have to take all this very, very seriously and try and understand, you know, what is it that is happening here? And certainly, I think, you know, the impacts of climate change. One of the things we know uh, about uh, the pandemic is that inequality has played a very large part in how it's played out, you know. The countries that have been worst affected are basically the countries that have the worst uh, inequalities. The United States, Brazil, uh, India, in United States and Brazil, there, there, there's factors of race and so on. Uh, in India, there's caste. So it's these, it's, uh, it's countries, these three countries have been sort of profoundly, uh, you might almost say, they've been disabled uh, uh, by the pandemic. They, have, they, they haven't been able to respond really, you know. In the United States, moreover, there's this whole issue of culture. I mean, it keeps coming up. People won't mask because uh, they feel that it uh, treads on their liberties or that it, uh, you know, that uh, it takes away their freedoms and so on. But the one thing we do know about climate change is that, uh, you know, when that flood is coming for you or when that uh, drought is coming for you, uh, uh, you're unlikely to be able to save yourself without help from others, you know? You have to be looking for help from others. You have to be looking for lessons from others. You have to be looking for uh, uh, warnings from others. And that there again, I think it's in so many ways, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the North American and the European responses really show that far from affluence, it was always in the climate change uh, discourse, it's always said that, you know, affluence will protect uh, countries that, that are rich, countries that have good infrastructure and so on, uh, will be uh, protected to some degree, whereas countries that don't have those things will be very badly affected. That turns out not to be the case at all. Uh, in fact, uh, you might almost say uh, that affluence is in many ways, uh, uh, it, accelerates uh, the impacts or it worsens the impacts. And, you know, I could go on about that at some, at some length, but I do feel that in many ways, uh, you know, advanced infrastructure and so on, uh, of course, they create many conveniences. They're, 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 it's great uh, to have electricity all the time, uh, which is something that I did not grow up with. I grew up with, you know, week long power cuts and so on. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can see in the future that, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, advanced infrastructure also creates great fr fragilities. You know, you think of a city like Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it's built in a place which is fundamentally uninhabitable. You know, it, uh, this area was made habitable by the invention of air conditioning. Now they routinely have uh, have day, d days that are over a hundred degrees. You know, imagine the amount of infrastructure you need to get electricity there, to get water there. It's a water-starved region, uh, uh, region. Just one little thing goes wrong and, uh, you know, the infrastructure just stops maybe for two, three days. Just imagine uh, the fallout of that. And yet, this is the part of the country that is receiving the most, the largest number of affluent migrants. You know, similarly, uh, you know, Miami, especially on the waterfront, you know, the real estate prices keep going up. You know, these are the aspects of the derangement which are, uh, you know, are almost incomprehensible. You wrote about that in terms of Mumbai as well and the way that Mumbai was built. So a couple of questions from our audience. I, I know we don't have that much time with you. One person writes, if as you showed, terrible storms, floods, fires have always been there, how is it that climate change is considered so much a cause of universal concern now? Is it because of more awareness or is the situation getting worse or out of control? Uh, yes, of course, we've always had, uh, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> bad weather has always existed and the climate has always been to some degree unpredictable. But what we see now is that uh, two things, uh, many of the impacts that we see ar um, uh, around us now are unprecedented uh, in human history. 
Uh, there are any number of uh, studies that show us this, the rate at which uh, uh, places are heating up, the sorts of droughts, the mega droughts that we are seeing, the melting of permafrost and so on. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no equivalent, equivalent for this within uh, uh, human history, within this 10,000 year period in which civilization evolved and so on. You know, uh, Of course, our distant ancestors lived through many other kinds of disruptions, but within uh, the period that we call uh, the Holocene, that is uh, the, the era in which human civilization arose, uh, uh, there's been no such experience. So all those things are completely different. Similarly, uh, what we also know now is that this is, these impacts are anthropogenic. It's human activity that's causing them. In the past, uh, climate disruptions were not caused by human activity. They were caused by natural fl um, oscillations, fluctuations, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's the that's the really great difference today. That these are anthropogenic impacts. And one last question before we run out of time with you, um, Levin Arnsberger here at Emory writes: Aside from the fact that poor developing countries are intensely affected by climate change, despite not contributing as much to it, there is also the idea that the West should not tell other countries what to do, shouldn't tell the quote global south to embrace sustainability, don't cut the rainforest, don't produce palm oil, et cetera. Can you comment on that? Uh, look, I think the idea that, um, you know, poor countries are going to be the worst affected, as I said before, I don't think this is the case. I think this is not true. You look at the places that are worst affected today, California. I mean, California has an ongoing climate disaster. Uh, you know, look at the wildfires that, you know, Californians have been uh, dealing with. I mean, I know so many people who, I personally know people who find it impossible to live there anymore, you know, with the uncertainty, with the bad air, with the fear. Uh, you, so California is one, you look at what's going on in Colorado today. California is one of the richest parts of the world. You know, you take uh, Southeastern uh, Australia. There again, they're being very badly hit by, um, uh, by climate change impacts, you know, wildfires, droughts, etc. So yes, I think countries are going to be hit. Poor, a lot of poor countries are going to be very badly hit, but please don't take any a comfort from this uh, from this idea that poor countries will bear the brunt of it that is not the case that will not that is already not the case that will not be the case in in future i think the climate movement made a very bad decision when they decided to uh, adopt this idea that you know uh, uh, the poor will be worst hit and the uh, and the affluent uh, you know uh, will be well off uh, i think the actual indicator of uh, uh, who will be worst hit etc lies rather in uh, the degree to which environments have been, uh, have been changed. You know, and that's really what is striking about uh, the areas that are now being uh, uh, most badly hit. And a lot of those areas lie in very Africa, uh, affluent countries. Uh, the environment of, uh, of California was completely re-engineered re you know, over the 19th and uh, 20th centuries. That's also true of the upper Missouri basin. You know? And it's interesting how, uh, you know, indigenous people who live there foretold all of this. They said, what you're doing to this land will come back to haunt you, you know? So, uh, you know, I don't think that it's going to be uh, as simple as these, as these formulae seem to suggest. And that's why I think we have to take this pandemic very seriously as a predictor of uh, future impacts. One more question and then I promise I'll let you go. And another part of the book that was so fascinating to me was this idea that the, the parts of the, of the US and, and other developed countries that seem to be really dealing with climate change are the militaries. And can you speak, share a little bit about that? Um, how is it the militaries are dealing with this and why do you think that is the part of the government that is really working to address the issue? <laughs> That's a very complicated question and I don't know that I can uh, get through it uh, very quickly. A large part of my new book is about that. Uh, look, uh, we don't, uh, in, in the first place, 
militaries are the world's largest uh, single institutional emitters. You know, military emissions in the United States are said to be account for like 20% uh, of uh, American emissions, you know. Uh, the, the Pentagon and the D Department of Defense, uh, you know, if, if it was just a country, it would be like, I think, fourth or fifth large, the, the fourth or fifth largest emitter in the world, you know. Uh, and uh, the same could be said of, uh, of militaries and elsewhere. You know, so a very large part of our greenhouse gas emissions actually comes from military activity, you know. A very large part, actually, you know, even though the, the experts are constantly turning out numbers on uh, climate change, no one has actually a figure uh, for exactly how much uh, military emissions uh, are, uh, you know. And actually, those numbers are not even, uh, are not even calculable, really, because uh, uh, one of the things that the U.S. elite put in place after the Second, uh, Second World War was that uh, military spending became uh, a stimulator for the economy. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so the the military has uh, it funds so many things, including universities. You know, so how do we actually account for how much of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions comes uh, from the military sector? We don't know, but the Pentagon, uh, for example, is also the largest landowner in the U.S. You know, so it's exposed on multiple fronts. Uh, you know, many of its installations are directly threatened by climate change. In fact, they've issued various studies which show uh, that they're threatened by rain bombs, by uh, sea level rise, by so many other things. But, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the, the, so the military has led the way often uh, in uh, uh, funding research on uh, alternative energy, on alternative technology. But as a, a base commander in Virginia uh, said at a town council meeting, uh, you know, he said, uh, our job is to protect the country, uh, not, to, uh, 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 not to stop climate change. You know, and that's the basic thing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the military exists today in, in many ways uh, to protect uh, the carbon infrastructure. You know, it exists to protect it globally. So how can we expect, uh, you know, uh, the military to be uh, the leader in, as it were, mitigating climate change? I mean, they can uh, do certain things, yes, but at the end of the day, that's not their mission. Well, Dr. Ghosh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this sobering um, conversation. And I want to um, also thank um, Dr. Jadik and Madhu Sheth and the Sheth Family Foundation for making it possible, as well as Goizueta Global and Mega Mandun. And I also, I just want to um, make a pitch that uh, about a year from now, um, our own curator of African art, um, Amanda Hellman, is curating an absolutely fabulous exhibition called And Now I Must Scream that will um, look at ways that visual artists are responding to the climate and other um, urgent issues of our time. And so we hope that you will be sure to join us for that um, exhibition a year from now. So thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh, for being with us. We're most grateful and Professor Sheth for making all of this happen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor yeah. Sheth. Bye. Goodbye. So good to have you. So good to have you. Thank it you. It was great to be back. Thank you. <laughs>